today's UFC fights are not real fights, they are more like entertainment fights. What's up everyone, welcome back to another video. As always, my name is Orlando Mortel and this is Mortel Dynamics. Today we're gonna read chapter seven of Hicks and Gracie's book, Breathe. Today's chapter is all about Japan. The chapter is entitled The Land of the Rising Sun. So in the last chapter we left off where Horian created the UFC to promote Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or to promote Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He chose Hoist Gracie instead of Hickson, which Hickson was a champion of the family, right? One might think the obvious choice for the ultimate fighting championship. But due to the fact that, first of all, Horian was trying to manipulate and control Hickson, and he didn't put Hickson in the actual UFC, Hickson find himself in this uncomfortable situation where, okay, I have to do something to provide to my family and what I do is fight. And if no one is signing me up for fights, how am I gonna, you know, earn my living or something? Yes, he had his Pico Academy, but you know, he made a lot of money fighting too. So the first part of this chapter is interesting because Hickson talks a lot about MMA philosophy today. These last few days have been re-listening to his podcast with Joe Rogan, him explaining how today's UFC fights are not real fights. Fights. they are more like entertainment fights you can learn more about that reading the chapter or listening to the podcast might be easier but the point is that it's not real fights and and you can find it kind of obvious first of all UFC and and UFC I guess it's a company but MMA today has a lot of rules has a lot of things that you cannot do it has timed events you know i think there are five minute rounds or something like that they have gloves as hickson explains jiu-jitsu was born as a self-defense mechanism and yes it's an art but it's designed or, or it was originally designed to help you defend yourself in any situation whatsoever. With that being said, in a real fight, you don't have gloves. In a real fight, there are no time limits. In a real fight, there's no of this, no out gouging, no groin punches. In a real fight, as we, I think, said in the last video, everything literally goes. So Hickson explains this basically in the first chapter. The chapter begins by Hickson saying, after the UFC promoters had oversold the event, the first event as a human cockfight, they attracted a pro wrestling audience that was completely ignorant about real fighting. For example, every time a fight went to the ground at the first UFC, the spectators booed because they didn't understand what they were watching. He has a good point because he says too that today, 98% of MMA fans have never stepped into the cage or even onto the mat, much less felt their noses break or tendons pop. Today's UFC oct octagon is the equivalent of the Roman Coliseum. When you think about it, it makes sense, at least for me. It has the intention of being a real fight and trying to quote unquote be see who the best fighter is they are more entertainment than real fights i remember that i was listening and i think it was the sec i don't remember if it was the first or the second podcast that hickson had with uh, joe rogan but he explained that there are some talks currently about making uh, an event or a company that has more of real valetudo fights the point is that today ufc is so big and there is so much money involved that professional fighters why would professional fighters fight a real valetudo event for less money when you can fight in ufc with those fancy rules and win a lot of money nevertheless that is the situation and when hickson was fighting even when it was just beginning he saw this coming he says that i had always wanted to fight in japan because of its martial arts history and culture unlike the americans they understood fighting 
So another thing that I that I heard is that in Japan that when two fighters are grappling and some uh, uh, someone let's say sweeps one or or makes a move uh, uh, an interesting move you can you can listen to the people ooh ah you know in uh, I guess uh, the UFC the American fights it's just people screaming for whatever reason Hickson tried to find a, a contract in Japan to fight in Japan but his first offer was like three thousand dollars for a fight so it was nothing the contract was uh, was a bad one his wife uh at the time kim stepped in she talked to the promoters they offered him fifty thousand dollars for a fight and if he won they would give him another fifty thousand dollars so let's say a hundred thousand dollars in general if he won now that he had a good offer he was all about you know going there to Japan and to fight. He had two obstacles, his father and, and his older brother, Horian. Of course, Horian was mad because he didn't want Hickson to leave, but at the same time, he was making Hickson's life impossible. He, was, he wasn't putting him in good fights in, U, in the UFC. He was trying to control him. So naturally, neither Hickson nor Kim trusted him. I can imagine it's heartbreaking because Horian was treating him that way. And when Hickson invited his father, Helio, to be in his corner for Japan, Helio declined. So it's like, you know, your father, your trainer, your everything. The one that you would expect to be there with you 100% of the time declined to be in your corner. You know, it, I haven't been in that situation, but it must have been heartbreaking to him. He says that my father lived in Brazil and was completely out of touch with what was going on in America. He had no idea how archaic the world of jiu-jitsu had gotten in the States. When I asked Helio to come to Japan to corner me, he declined. This broke my heart, but I still had to fulfill my mission. So at this point, the only offer or the only brother that rejected Horian's decree to bow, because that's another point. Horian basically said no one's going with Hickson. If Hickson wants to go rogue and go by himself, let him, but everyone's staying with me. But Hoyler Gracie ignored basically his older brother Horian and went with Hickson. At this point, because Hickson left for Japan, Hoyer Gracie fought UFC three alone without, I mean, not alone, but his, Hickson wasn't in his corner. So what ended up happening is that when your coach, when your real coach leaves, you don't have no one. A month before my first fight in Japan, Hoyes fought in UFC three without me in my corner. I watched the event on television and when I saw Kimo, his massive steroid swollen opponent walk to the ring with a wooden cross the size of a telephone pole in his back, I sensed trouble. Kimo easily defended Hoy's takedowns and landed some big punches. Hoy's finally managed to get him onto the ground, but Kimo took his bag and began to punch him. My brother weathered more heavy blows before he was able to grab Kimo's pony ponytail, control his head, and secure an arm lock. Hoy's won the bout, but he had to be carried out of the ring and could not answer the bell for his next fight. Needless to say, UFC 3 would not be won by a Gracie. This is my opinion. I'm not sure about what I'm about to say, but I think they in general, the family just sent Hoist to fight before he was ready. And yes, because he had a superior technique, namely Jiu Jitsu, he started winning, didn't mean he was ready. Yes, Hickson started very early too, but Hickson is Hickson. I mean, he has this warrior mentality that it's either I win or I die. I mean, maybe I don't know what I'm saying, but again, Hickson critiques the UFC because he explains that by putting this by the way the UFC was promoting the event by by some heroes and some villains. The fight in general was becoming more and more like professional wrestling, a stage on which to introduce heroes and heels. So it was not an honor code to fight 
to defend family name, to defend this style, to defend this art. It was literally just entertainment. And Hickson, as he says, welcomed the samurai and the Bushido code. He says that the tenets of the code changed slightly over time, but they can generally be described as righteousness, courage, compassion, respect, honesty, honor, and loyalty. So in general, he was just concerned with real danger, not with just entertainment uh, danger, let's say. Hickson says that, worse than the violence and the physical punishment of the actual fight was the lonely hell of training for a professional fight. I never lose sight of the fact that I am the one who jumps over the top rope and into the ring. Even though I trained regularly at the Pico Academy, much of my pre-fight preparation consisted of brutal cardio and bodyweight exercises. So once in Japan, Hickson went to this cabin in the woods in nature. It was just Hickson, Hoxson, his son, his wife Kim, and Hoyler, his, his brother. Hickson had some brutal mental training, not just physical. The physical part, obvious. The mental part, not too obvious, but he explains. He submerged his entire body in frozen rivers just to control and to train his mind for just hard shit besides that he had a way to train himself to just be so mentally spiritually and emotionally tough that he says that once he finished training and meditation and all the things he did he was just ready to die he wouldn't tap for no reason it was in his words i am ready to die and just to think about that how many people or fighters or professional fighters can one think and say does every time you go to the ring you go ready to fight or do you go ready to when you feel you're almost at your limit tap out i think that's what makes hickson very unique I'm sure a lot of people have that mentality too. I'm sure that a lot of people are, uh, I'll pass out or I'll die before I tap out. Not really. When you go to the fact, when you go to the proof to how many real fighters don't tap out, don't tap ever. I mean, I don't think you can find many. So of course, before the actual fight in Japan, Hickson, you know, he, he just concentrated so much. He was ready to die. He was just, you know, analyzing every movement that he can do before or after the fight so his first fight in was in a 50,000 person arena against a japanese judoka named yoshiri yoshinori nishi this fight ended pretty quick i mean all of them all of them ended pretty quick but this was this was the first fight this is what Hickson says that the bell rang i walked towards him not even a fighting stance but as if i was crossing a park I immediately sensed Nishi's confusion. He didn't know if I was coming to shake his hand, kiss him, or punch him. By the time he realized it, I had bridged the gap. It was too late to hit me. We were in a clinch and he was headed to the ground with me on top of him. Worse than the fact that he was now on the ground, his playbook was, had gone out the window and he was completely lost. A few punches later, I sank a choke and the fight was over in less than three minutes. It's very interesting to see and read about these fights because it's real. I mean, he ended the fight quick. You would think that these are amateurs, the one he's fighting, but these are professional f fighters. I mean, these are not children. These are supposed to be the baddest of fighters in Japan. And he just, you know, choked them like it was nothing. Second fight came against a 6'5", 275 pound Wing Tsun fighter named David Levicki. This guy was pretty much scared because before he fought Hickson, he told Hickson that if you get my arm, please don't break it before the fight. So when someone tells you that, you pretty much set yourself up for failure, you know what I mean? In this fight, they started, you know, uh, wrestling and everything. They fell out of the octagon. The 275 opponent got uh, fell on top of Hickson. I mean, Hickson could have gotten hurt. Hickson reversed the position, continued fighting him, got back in the ring. The opponent was hesitating to come back in the ring. But basically, after he got into the ring again, Hickson choked the sh out of him. Keep in mind, these fights are pretty fast one after another. They don't have, as I, as I think I remember, a lot of time to uh, recover. These are fights like one after another. 
Third fight came, I faced a tall American kickboxer named Bud Smith in the finals. The second bell rang, he threw a weak front kick that I caught and used to throw him on his back. 20 unanswered punches later, Smith also tapped out. So of course, it was an honor for Hickson to win in the country that had the code that he admired so much, the Bushido code, the samurai code. He tried to express that to the Japanese people. So he got his money, he won, he went that back to his family. He had a much deserved vacation. He served with his family. He, he was having a very good time when his Japanese representative told him that there was someone in Japan talking shit about him, that they were going to kick his ass. This Japanese guy that was talking shit was no other than one of Japan's most famous pro wrestlers, Nobuhiko Takara. Hickson was just having a vacation with his family, so he hadn't answered. When he didn't answer immediately Takara's, I guess, accusations, people in Japan were saying that Hickson's silence meant that he was scared, that he didn't want to fight Takara. So Hickson wrote a letter and explained, as we have talked before, that the real reason he didn't want to fight Takara is because Hickson didn't want to fight in a professional wrestling fight because those, those fights were kind of set. They had a lot of rules, they had a lot of uh, limitations, and Hickson didn't fight that way. Hickson fought real fights. Vale Tudo, no time limits, just fight until someone taps out or someone dies. During all these situations, the book ends, or the last few pages of the book, are explaining this situation about Joji and Joe. If you follow Hickson and his story and everything, you have probably heard about this because it's a very famous story. A week later, Takata's protege, Joji and Joe, one of the evil, one of the villains of Japanese pro wrestling, held a press conference in Tokyo to announce that he was traveling to Los Angeles to fight me to the death. I'm gonna summarize this story because it's pretty long. He writes for about five pages explaining just this story. So basically, Joji and Joe, uh, some Japanese representative, Japanese press invaded Hickson's Pico Academy, right? All of a sudden, Hickson was with his family in his house eating breakfast when Luis Li Mao, one of the black belts of Hickson's Gracie in his academy, called him and, has, and says, Hickson, there are some Japanese press and, and some Japanese people here say, uh, saying that uh, they want to fight you or something like that. They, they basically interrupted the academy. Hickson, without no hesitation, still with his uh, pajamas on, got into uh, the car or whatever he had and went straight to the academy. He was with his family. I think he brought his wife and his kids with him too because Crone Gracie uh, in his podcast with Joe Rogan was explaining this too. They got there, basically Hickson says uh, to Joji Angel, which was there, look, you want to fight? No problem. I'll fight. I'm ready to. I'm ready for it. Just uh, sign this. Uh, I, I forget the term, but it's uh, the, the paper that says that if you get injured or something, I'm not liable for that. And the Japanese interpreter told them told that to Joji Anjo, and Joji Anjo said something in Japan, and the translator said, uh, "Mr. Hickson, Mr. Gracie, do you mean that uh, if he don't sign?" you won't fight and Hickson immediately understood that it was an uncomfortable situation because if he said yes if you don't sign I won't fight he would go back to Japan and said that he was scared so it was like what do I do and Hickson says you know what forget the paper you want to fight we'll fight but and he told his black belts his students keep the press out so the only people inside was Hickson his students Joji Angel his representative and yeah, his, his wife and his kids, uh, his kids. So long story short, Hickson beat the, shit, the living shit out of this guy. There's a picture on the internet, but the video of the actual fight hasn't been released by Hickson. Listening multiple times to Joe Rogan's podcast with him, he has said that he will release the video sometime or whatever, or put it on sale or, uh, or, or sell it, I mean but the video isn't out there anymore.
Joji and Joe apologized to Hickson after that fight. It was a very bloody fight, by the way. I'll leave it there for now. You can look for more information if you want. He was a hypocrite because he apologized to Hickson, but went back to Japan and said that it wasn't a real fight. It was just Hickson students jumped him. You know, it's, it's disappointing because it, it it's like, you have no honor, you have no integrity. You apologize to me, talk to me face to face like a man and said, look, I apologize, you know, you the man. And then you go back to your country and talk shit about me. Oh, oh the students jumped, there you go. You have no honor whatsoever. Long story short, Hickson talked to his representative, gave him the tape and said, look, make a press conference, show this to the Japanese press and say and and explain that and, and and you know show the evidence that it was a real fight that happened the people were uh, the japanese were very mad with joji anjo but again that raised hickson's image even more on 7th december a uwf united wrestling federation representative dressed in a black suit accompanied by his colleague showed up at my studio at approximately 11 o'clock in the morning. They demanded to speak with my assistant, fearing for the welfare of the students because of the belligerent and antagonistic attitude of the UWF representatives called and told me to come to the studio immediately. When I arrived at the studio, I questioned the representative as to the reason for their visit. At this point, the UWF representative then advised me that they did not come to talk about business, they came to fight. I accepted the challenge, thinking that the big representative was Takara. I don't have to describe the fight itself because Mr. Anjo's face tells the story of what happened better than words ever could. <laughs> Hickson was a savage. I mean, he's still a savage. I don't want to validate the dishonorable acts of the UWF or the foolish act of Mr. Anjo, but I must say, in this instance, Mr. Anjo did fight for real and he lost like a man. Even though the UWF came to my studio by surprise, I proved to them that I am always ready to fight for my honor. Again, the Bushido code. At the current time, I have several fights, fight deals, plans for the near future. To me, these legitimate endeavors are more important than any more surprises created by the UWF. Thank you, Hicks and Gracie. So with that press conference that was released, Hickson ended this chapter with which was this part of Japan in his life, this first Japanese open. After the Joji Anjo fight, they took a picture. Uh, I'll put it up on the video so you can see it better. And that was basically Hickson's first situation in Japan, the Japan Valtudo Open 1. So guys, that was it. Next chapter will be Paradigm Shift in Chapter 8. I guess this will get deeper and more personal because of what happens to Hux and Gracie, his older son. But we'll keep reading. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.